Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking Steve and the organisers for the invitation. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be here this week, and I'm having a lot of fun and learning a lot, actually. I'm going to talk about our dietary obese model, which is largely based in the rat. Uh, we've done a bit of mouse work as well, but the work I'll present today is rat-based. And it's really work started more than a decade ago at the University of Melbourne. Um, this is Sydney, and if you want to experience it yourself, the International Congress of Neuroendocrinology will be held here in August this year, and there's still time to register. It's a fantastic program with actually a lot of great international speakers in the realm of obesity, as well as neuroendocrine uh, and behaviour. If we think about obesity, it's a bit like the talk we had yesterday from John about schizophrenia, where there's a strong genetic and environmental interaction. And many of us talk about gene environment effects. Uh, we have hundreds of susceptibility genes for obesity, and several of these, including BDNF, FTO, and MC4 receptors, are centrally located. The reason the obesity epidemic is of such concern around the world is partly because of the dramatic uh, changes in food availability uh, and probably reduced energy expenditure that's occurred over the last century or so. There's a range of other environmental factors, and many of these are what we study in my laboratory. So we think that the obesity epidemic may be tied in some ways to maternal obesity, because as we heard this morning, obesity in women of reproductive age is increasing all around the world. Uh, in the States, it's now 50% of women who are approaching pregnancy, either overweight or obese. We're sleeping less, we're probably more stressed, we're heating our houses more. Uh, we have endocrine disruptors stored in our fat that might be contributing to our risk of obesity. We're very interested as well in the concept of gut biota affecting obesity, and you'll be aware of animal work uh, showing a link a bi-directional link between biota uh, and body weight regulation. And lastly, we have epigenetic players that are relevant. Uh, we heard this morning in some way about programming of obesity by maternal factors, and part of that is through environmental effects whereby DNA uh, expression is altered without actually changing the code. So things such as nutrition, toxins, cigarette smoking, uh, can impact through a non-genetic path. We're looking at various aspects, and again, just like the life course of schizophrenia, there are many time points through life where obesity risk uh, can be regulated. In adulthood, our activity levels, our intake, uh, can critically control our body weight, so if we don't reduce intake, uh, as our needs reduce with ageing, obesity can occur. I'll talk today about some of our stress work uh, where stress does appear to be linked to body mass index. The lactational window is also very important, so early life is critical, um, and you can clearly modulate weight risk simply by affecting uh, food availability during lactation. And again, we heard some beautiful work about that this morning. The in utero environment is clearly another target area whereby altered body weight of the mother can have important impacts on the fetus. I'll also show you some work. So obesity risk is largely conferred by our mother's and father's genes. And people such as Claude Bouchard will put our genetic risk as high as 70%. But that can be modulated by all of these environmental effects. Our lab's also interested in non-genetic effects of both the mother and the father. So I'll show you a little bit of data about paternal obesity this morning. So just to set the scene, we'll talk a little bit about the effects of palatable food uh, on behaviour, or a lot about this in fact. We'll touch on early life stress, so what happens to animals that are stressed uh, post-birth and their metabolic trajectory. We'll touch on maternal obesity and paternal obesity, uh, and I'll just comment a little bit on the gut-brain axis. So this gives you a snapshot of what my lab works on. Uh, I, in fact, started back here in 1996 making rats fat in Melbourne, uh, and I've moved 
uh, earlier and earlier and earlier uh, since then. So the brain is critical in this partnership between genes and environment because the hypothalamus shown here, this is the uh, third ventricle, the arcuate nucleus receives multiple inputs from the periphery, from the pancreas, the adipose tissue, the stomach and the gut. And you can see here two cell groups, the NPY agouti cells that stimulate feeding, and right next door, the POMC and CART cells that inhibit feeding. There are critical Arcuro PVN projections shown here, and you can see uh, a number of contacts are made with critical feeding regulators in the PVN. The arcuate also projects to the lateral hypothalamus, which contains a different suite of peptides, including melanin concentrating hormone and orexin, two potent orexigenic peptides. This nice review also comments on the projections up from the nucleus tractus solitarius to the hypothalamus and the connections between the hypothalamus and reward centers such as the VTA, the striatum. And of course, there's a hippocampal involvement here as well. So the hippocampus also communicates with the hypothalamus. And this is probably relevant to feeding. And we'll touch on this later. There was an interesting poster yesterday, for instance, around the fact that leptin has behavioral effects, uh, such as effects on cognition. Uh, and yesterday, there was a poster about effects of leptin on mood. It's a complex system. There's a lot of uh, redundancy in it, which is why tackling obesity pharmacologically is such a challenge. Uh, and it's a homeostatically very uh, elegantly designed but, but clunky system. In terms of obesity in humans, there's a lot of interest in what might be going wrong, and this data out of the Hammersmith group shows that in obese people shown here in the dark symbols uh, versus controls in the open, there's reduced plasma levels of PYY, a hormone made from the gut that reduces food intake through hypothalamic actions. And you can see here they have a lower response to a meal, and in response to this meal, they report feeling less full. So obesity is a state here with lower levels of an appetite-inhibiting peptide. The other problem in obesity is once you gain weight, if you lose weight, you lower the plasma levels of appetite inhibitors. And this makes weight maintenance after weight loss very difficult. Uh, there's a very nice paper in New England Journal by Joe Proeto from Melbourne shown here where Joe looked at subjects after weight loss. Uh, their control levels are in the dark symbols. And you can see here, these, and this is a postprandial uh, assay, so PYY went up slightly after a meal. But you can see in the same subjects after weight loss, their basal levels of this peptide were much less. So they've lost plasma levels of an inhibitory appetite peptide. On the other hand, on the left, you can see ghrelin levels. Ghrelin is the hormone from the stomach that stimulates our feeding, released before a meal. Their ghrelin levels at rest have increased, so they're getting more of a signal from their stomach telling them to eat. And you can see that postprandial drop is, is pretty well conserved, uh, but the levels at both week 10 of weight loss in blue and week 62 in the red are elevated. So Joe's thesis is that dieting, once you've gained weight, is very hard and it's incredibly difficult to maintain it and the proportion of people who can do that is very low. The real issue, I think, and it's well illustrated in a place such as Las Vegas where we're being bombarded with messages about how we can eat so well and easily. Uh, and I think Voltaire put it very well here, eating is pleasurable. Uh, and a lot of our environmental changes in the last 50 years have been around making food very palatable, uh, energy dense, and easily available. If you think about supermarkets today compared to when my mother was buying food as I was growing up, very different environment. Hans Rudi Batud has uh, made some very nice cartoons uh, that really ask the question, why are we as a population shifting from this homeostatic regulation of food that our ancestors would have relied upon where we eat because we need fuel and we have exerted ourselves so we need to homeostatically regulate fuel levels to the right here to this more hedonic style of feeding 
where we have palatability that may be driving intake, we have different cues uh, that influence our choices, and we have food that also uh, is rewarding and involves things like the opiates and the dopamine pathways. Uh, and you'll be aware of Volkov's work relating food and drugs of addiction and the pathways that uh, intersect there with similar responses. So there's an element of reward uh, with food intake that may be playing into uh, this hedonic type of behaviour. And so when I started doing this, as Steve said, I began by going to the supermarket and buying high-fat, low-cost uh, foods for the rats. Uh, the, the model is um, a slightly lower protein content than normal, about a 35% fat, which is around the Australian average. 35% uh, energy is fat, and the rest is carbohydrate. And we compare that with a low-fat, regular animal house chow. Uh, and this is the sort of data we get for energy intake, the chow in the purple, the high fat in the blue. As soon as we offer the rats this diet, they con consume to excess, they gain weight, uh, their fat mass increases quite quickly, leptin's already up after a week or two, uh, body weight takes a couple of weeks, uh, blood pressure goes up after about 10 weeks. This is a model of obesity-related hypertension, and the animals develop a metabolic syndrome type phenomenon. This is the food. The meat pie that we talked about is in fact the equivalent of your hot dog probably. It's what you eat at the footy uh, with tomato sauce. And we've offered them cake, pasta, dim sims. This is lard and condensed milk laced chow uh, and chips. The, the rats are always offered low fat chow, but they tend to eat very little of that around 5 to 10 percent maximum of their energy comes from the low-fat chow. This is a model of high choice. So it's a bit like a smorgasbord. We give them fresh food daily. We give them five choices, and there's a bit of flexibility around that choice. And Barbara Rolls has very elegantly shown in humans and rats uh, that choice drives intake. And this model has been repeated now more than 10 times in my lab, and we get very robust more than doubling of intake, very similar responses. For some of our work, we've shifted to a regular uh, purified chow approach uh, because we want to control micronutrients a bit better, but we, we still run both models in the lab. So in terms of the high fat uh, effect on animals, more than a doubling of intake, 30% heavier, trebling of fat mass. Uh, they're hyperleptinemic and hyperinsulinemic. They're glucose intolerant, lipids are doubled, and we began by looking in the hypothalamus and showed gross changes in the peptides that drive feeding and time-dependent changes. So in our hands, it takes at least 12 weeks to see a reduction in some of the peptides, such as neuropeptide Y. Early on in the diet, we don't see much effect. But peptides such as NPY is down-regulated with chronic obesity, yet the animals are continuing to overeat. Uh, and there's a phenomenon known as leptin resistance, where leptin levels are high, but the animals seem to be uh, able to withstand that signal. And so we want to look at this more fully. And Michelle Hansen, in her PhD, looked at ICV injections of NPY in feeding responses. And this slide shows you animals between five and eight weeks of diet on the top and four months of diet at the bottom. And this slide shows you just how powerful NPY is. This is one nanomole of NPY injected into the lateral ventricle in the light phase in satiated animals. So they've come through the night, they've eaten to satiety, but within a couple of hours of that, we can get them to eat a quarter of their daily intake in just one hour. This is a very robust response all around the world. People see the same thing. It's driven by Y1 and Y5 receptors. And as you can see, at this time point, the animals were responding normally. Chow and fat-fed animals have the same trajectory. This is the same animal's response to vehicle, so they're not very hungry until you give them NPY. But you can see at this time point, when we think that the, receptor, the receptors are upregulated because the NPY is downregulated, the fat animals are hyper-responsive in the blue here compared to the chow animals. 
And you can see even at rest, the calf animals are eating more in this light phase window. So we think that this chronic obesity is reducing uh, NPY, upregulating the receptors, allowing excess responsiveness. We showed that this was transmitter specific, so they hyper responded to things like melanocortin agonists, uh, but not to MCH, another orexigen. Since that time, we spent a lot of time thinking about what it is about these animals that allows them to continue eating. And when I moved to Sydney, I started a collaboration with psychology, and we began to look at the microstructure of feeding uh, and looking more closely what the animals were doing. So this is the PhD of Sara Martia, who's just submitted. And we looked at cafeteria versus chow rats and videoed them in their home cage. Uh, and in this data, each of the uh, lions is an individual rat. On the left, we have chow animals after five weeks of the diet. So we get them in as young adults uh, and then look at their meals. And Sarah adapted Lundell's behavioral satiety sequence, where she deemed that a meal was anything but a rat uh, ate, groomed, and slept. That was classified as a meal. On the left are the chow, 12 animals. And on the right are the calf animals. And you can see that the chows are having five or six meals uh, over the dark phase. The calf are having three, maybe four meals. We also looked at snacks. So a snack was anything where the animal ate but didn't sleep. And this was the first time anyone had classified it in quite that way. So Sarah counted snacks here in the chow fed animals on the left at five weeks. And here are the snacks in the cafeteria fed rats on the right. And you can see, I hope, that there's more snacking going on in the calf animals compared to the chow animals. And when we integrate that over time, and this data shows you three time points, five weeks, 10 weeks, and 15 weeks of the diet, the Meals in the solid bars show a clear and significant reduction in meal number in the cafeteria rats, and this is preserved across time. So at 15 weeks, the cafeteria rats are having fewer meals uh, than the chow animals. Early on, they're having more snacks, so they have more total feeding bouts at five weeks of the diet. Uh, this reduction in snack, this change in snack number uh, abates over time, uh, but remember, these animals are still consuming double the energy in these meals. We wondered whether their behavior early on would have any effect on their ultimate trajectory, given this difference at five weeks. So at this time point, they're having more snacks, more bouts, and fewer meals. So when we looked at whether they compensated for their snacking, this data shows an examination of what they were doing at five weeks, if you look at snack number on the y-axis versus the amount of their feeding that was represented by snacks. And the chow animals in the open symbols show that if, an, if a rat snacked a lot, that accounted for most of its eating. So it compensated by having fewer meals. But the calf animals weren't so good at that. And you can see much greater scatter in these solid symbols. They, compared to this very tight correlation in those eating just the low-fat chow. The right panel shows you how the snacking behavior correlates with their final body weight. And in the chow animals, there was no real pattern. The animals are all clustering around 600 grams and it didn't really imp wasn't impacted by their snacking. But in the calf animals, certainly in the majority of them, those who snacked the most ended up the heaviest. And you can see the body weights here are up over 900 grams in some cases. So we think that their snacking behavior may have some impact uh, on their final body weight. How that's mediated, we don't know. Uh, but we believe that this microstructural change may uh, index something about that particular animal. We've been very interested over the years, too, in the fact that the animals are very happy to get their food. They're very placid. Uh, we find them quite calm when they're on this diet. And we've actually um, wondered about what happens when we take them off the diet. And we finally 
actually did the experiment here shown uh, where Tim South took four groups of animals, a group that was continued on chow, um, and this <coughs> the time course here starts after 16 weeks of the diet. So this is a chronic dietary model. They've fed the food for 16 weeks. And then at this point, we have a group who's continuing on chow, a group who's continuing on calf, and these are now uh, kilojoules. So you can see, again, a doubling of the intake and a fairly stable doubling. A third group who started on calf and then was switched to chow, and a fourth group started on chow and switched to calf. And you can see this clear reduction in those switched to chow and an overeating in those switched to calf. We looked at the animals two days after that switch and did a restraint stress test, 30 minutes restraint with cortisol measures uh, before and after that. Um, and we expected to see that the rats switched uh, to chow uh, would be more stressed. In fact, that wasn't a significant finding. But what we found was that um, those rats switched from the chow to the calf had a reduced plasma corticosterone response to that restraint stress. And this is in line with work by people like Mary Delman, uh, who would argue that this is a comfort food um, and it might assuage the effects of a novel stressor. We then killed the animals nine days after the switch. And you can see at this point the chow animals are still very unhappy having been taken off their calf. Uh, they're still under eating and they're losing weight and fat. The calf animals who've been switched to the calf um, still have a fairly high intake, even relative to those that are maintained on the calf. And at this time point, we found that the rat switch from the calf to the chow had higher CRH message in the dorsal hypothalamus containing the PVN, as well as in the amygdala. And we found changes in dopamine receptors in the ventral tegmental area, so increased D1. These are in the animals switched from the chow to the calf. Um, D2 um, as well as TH. So we think that we're very interested in this nexus between uh, the hypothalamus and reward pathways. So we've seen changes in dopamine in the VTA. Uh, we followed up with another study where Sarah again gave extended exposure to animals. And at this point, we looked at two time points, seven weeks and 16 weeks. And what we found was that at 16 weeks, of diet, the cafeteria rats had reduced mu opioid and cannabinoid 1 receptors in the VTA. And in fact, any exposure to the cafeteria diet um, was found to cause these changes in CB1 and mu opioid receptors. So again, this nexus between uh, re reward areas and chronic response to this cafeteria food. More recently, we've been interested in cognitive effects of this diet. And it follows a, a many pub publications from others showing that chronic high-fat diet might have cognitive uh, effects. It's an area that's quite hard to study in the human, but if you look, there is evidence for it. Um, it depends on the type of evidence and the study, but this work uh, was a population-based study where they looked at a number of parameters uh, in thousands of individuals and found that overall cog poorer cognition was associated with greater cholesterol intake. Um, this is a, a nice study looking at the acute effects of an unhealthy diet where healthy young men were given a very poor diet with high in fat for just five days um, and they found impaired attention <coughs> and executive function after just uh, that short window. Uh, and in Australia, CSIRO is very famous for making a very nice diet book. Uh, they're very interested in food and uh, diets. And when they look in a population on their diet, they found cognitive improvement, uh, which was evident after just eight weeks uh, of a healthy diet compared to those uh, on a less healthy diet. So hard to measure uh, in the human, important probably in the age-related cognitive decline, where you can see a cognitive change more readily. Uh, we looked at this in rats. Again, we're using male sprague dorleys. 
and we wanted to ask particularly whether we could see an acute effect um, of diet on cognition. Uh, and so there's a bit of slippage here in the slide, but there's two groups, um, a regular diet group and a cafeteria diet group. And in this CAF diet, we gave them sugar to drink, 10% uh, sucrose, which is roughly equivalent to Coca-Cola. So they had two bottles of water in the regular diet um, and sugar and water in the cafeteria group. And we did a novel object test <coughs> where we tested both responses to uh, a novel object. Um, and on a different day, the animals were given a place task uh, where the object had been shifted. Um, and the place task is hippocampal dependent. So in this experiment, we exposed animals to the diet um, after they'd had a baseline test. And then we measured them again at six days, 12 days, and three weeks of the diet. And then we killed them at four weeks and took the hippocampus. And what we found was that the calf animals in the red symbols uh, performed the same as the chow animals in the blue on the object task. Um, so their, their preference is greater than 0.5, so they're noting that the new object uh, has arrived and they're spending more time exploring that object. There was no difference in exploration time across the groups, so both groups explored for the same period. But you can see on the right that the calf animals in the red uh, were less able after the diet, as early as six days, uh, to know that this object had been shifted. And this deficit was preserved out to 21 days at test three. Uh, so it seems to be uh, related to spatial navigation, uh, which implicates the hippocampus. We looked in the uh, hippocampus at a range of markers. We were interested in looking at whether uh, neuroplastic markers like BDNF might be regulated, um, as well as some of the inflammatory markers that we heard about in this morning's symposium. And what we found was that um, at four weeks of diet, you can see here fat mass is dramatically affected in these animals. Again, they're Caloric intake was much greater in the calf sugar group. Their leptin was doubled. They're hyperinsulinemic. Uh, and TNF-alpha in the hippocampus here was significantly elevated in the calf compared to the regular diet groups. There were no changes in BDNF or neurotin at this four-week time point. We were then interested to ask, well, we've got a diet here with high fat and high sugar, so can we segregate those contributions? Uh, and um, there's some synergy here with some work from Thaler and others looking at inflammatory type changes in the human brain. <coughs> here they're correlating body mass index with uh, markers of gliosis. So we went back and <coughs> Here we've used four different diets. So we have a regular diet group, a group just drinking sugar, and their energy intake is shown down here. So their energy intake wasn't different to the chow animals. They ate a bit less chow, but they drank sugar. Uh, we have the calf sugar uh, group that we previously had, and then we had a calf group who didn't get sugar to drink. And you can see that energy intake was quite similar across those uh, two groups. Body weight's on the left, so the regular diets uh, gained less weight. The sugar animals uh, were heavier, and the two cafeteria diet groups uh, gained the most weight. Uh, we did the same behavioral measures uh, and found the same deficit. In fact, uh, all three groups uh, with the diet implemented were had the same deficit in the place task, but no effect on the object task. And when we look in these animals at their TNF-alpha in the hippocampus, uh, again at four weeks of diet, we found no association with the object task. But for the place task, there was a significant correlation between TNF-alpha uh, and their uh, preference, whereby the animals with the highest TNF-alpha are indicative probably of more hippocampal inflammation performed worse uh, on the place task. So we're invoking here some role, we think, of inflammation in the brain 
uh, in driving this cognitive decline. We need to do a lot more work about this uh, and the sorts of measures that we've talked about this morning in terms of microglial activation, trying to inhibit uh, the inflammatory response to the diet uh, are where we want to go next. It fits in with some very nice um, reviews from Konofsky and Davidson, which suggests that um, an unhealthy diet by inducing inflammation may in fact be contributing to hippocampal dysfunction that may in fact drive this unhealthy cycle of overeating. Uh, again, uh, an interesting concept and one that will require a bit more uh, work, I think, to unwrap. We're interested in uh, dietary interventions as well as things like exercise interventions uh, in this regard. And Amy Raquel, the postdoc uh, who's joined the group, looked at whether we could influence the object uh, and place task in animals fed the unhealthy diet uh, by giving them an exercise wheel in their home cage, allowing them to run. And Amy found that there was, um, again, the same. Uh, this is cafeteria exercise, cafeteria sedentary, chow exercise and chow sedentary, so there was no effect on object. Uh, in the cafeteria group, she found a similar impairment of the place task, uh, but this was corrected in a group who had access to voluntary exercise. Uh, we're still working through the brain tissues of these animals. She's also looked at um, other sorts of behaviours, uh, and here we've taken animals on the two diets uh, and familiarised them to two uh, energy equivalent flavours, grape and cherry Kool-Aid, and then we devalued one of those outcomes by exposing the animals to it, and then gave them um, a, a choice between the two solutions. And we found that the chow diet animals uh, had more entries uh, to the non-devalued solution, so they knew that they hadn't drunk that flavour before and wanted more of it, uh, demonstrating satiety, uh, satiety, specific satiety. Uh, but the cafeteria animals uh, could not discriminate as well, so they drank both solutions, the novel one and the one that had been devalued, uh, to equivalent amounts. So there seems to be some um, disruption by this diet uh, in their incentive value. So what I've shown you is that palatable food changes the brain. Uh, it may affect outcome. Uh, this excessive intake uh, is prolonged and, and consistent in our hands. If we reverse it, they're hyperphagic. They have altered CRH responses uh, and the chronic diet also affects things like opiate and cannabinoid receptors. And more recently, we found that the diet is associated with cognitive changes that may be corrected by things such as exercise. Another major arm of our work is around stress and the impact of uh, that on obesity. And specifically, we've been looking at early life stress, uh, where you can uh, look at subsequent impact on animals' body weight and metabolic risk. Uh, it's a complex area and, again, hard to measure in humans, but there's evidence that uh, under conditions of stress or perceived stress, people gain weight. Uh, those who are abused as young uh, people tend to be heavier. And uh, early, early changes, early stress in the family has also been found to exert some effects on growth uh, in quite young children. The relationship between weight gain, though, and um, affective disorders is incredibly complex and is probably bi-directional. So stress may be contributing to obesity, but also vice versa. So we model it with maternal separation, a very well-described model from over 30 years now, where you take animals away from the mother from days 2 to 14 uh, and compare that to a group who have just a short separation from their mother for 15 minutes. Um, this is work of Janthi Manium who showed that, um, as many others have, that if you take animals away from their mother, and here is the 15-minute control in the blue, S15 versus S180, the 180 spent less time in the open arm of an elevated plus maze, um, suggesting anxiety-like behaviour. But in those animals who had a running wheel in their cage, uh, this effect was reversed. As it was 
if the animals had access to a high fat diet. So the nice thing about a rodent model such as this is that we can take siblings and give one of them a control intervention and one exercise or diet and control for the maternal impact. We've also looked in these animals at restraint stress and those who were separated from their mother for three hours early in their life, um, and these animals are now um, seven or eight weeks old. 30 minutes of restraint causes an increase in plasma corticosterone, and here's the trajectory of the eight treatment groups. This group is the three-hour separated animals who are eating chow. And you can see they have um, slightly higher basal levels and an exaggerated response to that stress. But it was reversed by uh, high-fat diet in the blue here, and it was reversed by the presence of a running wheel. So anxiety-like behavior, restraint-induced uh, corticosterone were both dampened by high-fat diet or exercise in our hands. And this correlates with changes in hippocampal glucocorticoid receptor and uh, BDNF expression. And I think I have the data here. This is the reduction in uh, GR on the left in those animals who were separated, reversed by running, reversed by high-fat diet, and a similar pattern for BDNF. So the detrimental effects of early life stress were reversed by a high-fat diet or exercise. You may have noted we didn't see any additive effects when we combined those two. And we think, in fact, that there may be different mechanisms at play uh, because the effects don't seem um, to really go necessarily together. There are brain changes in BDNF, sorry, as well as the, the glucocorticoid receptor. Um, but our current work is really addressing the problem that this raises because the high-fat diet, while it reduced anxiety, uh, worsened the metabolic impost of the unhealthy diet. So the animals had a doubling of their insulin levels if they were stressed as a young animal and then fed the high-fat diet. So again, in line with work of Delman and others, um, if and we know that people exposed to stress report eating differently. So even people who under eat when they're stressed report eating more cookies, chips, cakes, sweets, and less protein, fruit, veg. So food choices are changed by stress even if you're under eating. If animals choose to eat uh, an unhealthy diet because they, or, or humans because they were stressed, um, we think that there's probably hippocampal but also peripheral changes in glucocorticoids that may promote metabolic harm. Um, and we're currently uh, trying to extend that work um, because we believe there will be an interaction between diet and early stress. There's evidence in humans, for instance, that those who are abused develop diabetes earlier uh, than the rest of the population. I'll touch now briefly on our work on maternal and paternal obesity. And again, we heard some very nice data this morning on the impact of uh, early life uh, environmental changes uh, in the maternal realm that impact on the baby. And as we've alluded to, this um, could be a major driver of the current obesity epidemic. So about Eight years ago, we started looking at this, making animals fat using the palatable high-fat diet we've talked about. And this is an example where we've looked at both uh, purified diet and cafeteria diet. Um, and interestingly, I find a very similar phenotype in the animals. So I think it's more about whether the mother's fat or not uh, than how she got there. Uh, the impact on the offspring in my hand seems to be roughly the same. We have done a bit of a dose effect study where we made animals slightly fat and got them pregnant, uh, and we did see less of an impact um, on the offspring than if she was very fat. Other exposures are also critical, though, and th this is nice data from 2.6 million human pregnancies showing that severe maternal stress can impact on uh, whether the baby's um, low birth weight or small for gestational age, and the trimester or the period of stress 
impacted the outcome. So in this study, if the mother lost a child or a partner during her pregnancy, uh, her baby had increased risk uh, of being born small. Um, and as you heard this morning, that increases your risk of subsequent obesity development. So uh, psychological stress in the mother uh, can drive offspring outcome as well as maternal body weight. Very nice data also suggests that maternal obesity is linked to um, aspects of um, ADHD type behaviors. So this is Rodriguez looking at ne negative emotionality. Uh, and uh, these are children who were five years of age at testing and they were ranked uh, by a neutral observer who wasn't aware of the mother's status. So maternal obesity may also impact on other elements of the child. Um, they've controlled here for um, maternal education, income, smoking, and, and all of the, the confounding variables. And it's, it's, I think, easy to understand how maternal obesity may impact uh, on subsequent obesity risk, uh, given the intimate relationship between signals from the periphery uh, that will be crossing the placenta uh, and development of the hypothalamus. And this morning we heard about some of the potential inflammatory mediators uh, whereby uh, maternal nutrition may impact uh, on development. Um, there's very nice work from Sebastian Bure showing that ghrelin, uh, insulin and leptin all regulate uh, the development of these trajectories uh, early in life. In our hands, we've found that offspring of fat mothers have increased uh, markers of hippocampal inflammation. So fat mothers have offspring with greater hippocampal TNF-alpha, for instance, um, and that's exacerbated if the offspring itself then goes on to consume an unhealthy diet. So in our hands, offspring of obese mothers are born fairly normal, but they rapidly separate. Um, these mothers are continuing the unhealthy diet, so their milk is probably higher in energy, uh, and the animals are certainly drinking a bit more when we weigh them. So a separation very early on. We've done a lot of work on hip hypothalamic peptides, showing that they're regulated very early on in the offspring. They have altered responses to fasting uh, and um, other changes. Um, this shows you the fat mass of these animals at 21 days here at weaning. Uh, they're double the fat mass of the control offspring. So a very rapid weight gain. We've also shown that if we manipulate intake by adjusting the numbers of pups that the mother suckles, again, as we heard this morning, a litter size adjustment is a very elegant way of adjusting intake. Uh, and if we give the mother three pups to suckle, her animals end up up here with a great exacerbation of body weight, adiposity, leptin, insulin, and metabolic risk. Um, and in a lean mother, if you give her only three pups to suckle, her animals end up roughly here in terms of body weight, uh, with slightly less adiposity than that uh, induced by obesity in the mother. So we can separate out the effects of gestational overnutrition, lactational overnutrition, and then add post-weaning overnutrition uh, to look at the additivity of those impacts. And we've spent a fair bit of time looking at that in my lab. We've also looked at some of the obesity uh, genes, and FDO is under a bit of a cloud at the moment because there's a lot of concern about whether the gene defect really is the FTO gene. Uh, but this is an interesting gene because it's highly expressed in the brain. You can see here, this was the first paper describing it in Science 2007. It's, it's quite uh, abundant in the brain. And so we wanted to look in the offspring of our fat mums at whether FTO uh, message was regulated. In, in offspring of fat mothers here on the right, there was increased FTO in the hypothalamus of obese mothers, regardless of their litter size. So this is normal litter. This mum on the right is only suckling three pups. But FTO was upregulated in the offspring, uh, and that went with being from a high-fat mother. The FTO was correlated with the animal's fat mass, both visceral fat as well as epididymal fat. And so we have a relationship here between FTO expression. So this isn't a gene defect. This is regular FTO. Um, but there's evidence in human 
that FDO may be related to food choice. And so we looked at the brothers of these animals. So this is weaning. These are 21, 20 days old. We looked at their brothers who be put onto a diet uh, and looked at whether FTO at weaning correlated with their subsequent outcomes. And we found that FTO was correlated with energy intake and adiposity in the siblings of these animals, but only if they were consuming an unhealthy diet. So at 18 weeks old, the brother's intake correlated with his sibling's FTO. It is somewhat in line with this large epidemiological study that looked at FTO um, variants in humans and found that those with the um, FTOA allele correlated with the percent of calories that those people were getting from fat. So this implies that something about your FTO status may impact on your food choice. So there's a lot of very nice work on maternal obesity showing that altered nutrition either prenatally or early in the postnatal window has a number of effects on the brain. It affects appetite regulation, hypothalamic changes in peptides, adiposity, and that contributes to later obesity risk. And again, we heard this morning about some behavioural changes that occur in the offspring of obese mothers. We're very interested in this as a window of intervention. We've done a lot of studies looking at pharmacological and exercise interventions because you can moderate the impact of having been gestated in an obese mother by promoting a healthy lifestyle, such as offering voluntary exercise. And I think that's a very important message. Just one slide, or two slides on the paternal story. Um, Shou Fang was an endocrine trainee who wanted to look at whether fat dads could impact on their offspring through a non-genetic pathway. Uh, and so we set up a cohort where we had fat fathers impregnating lean mothers and looked at whether their offspring had any effect. And as you might expect, we, the literature on this is very crowded and, and unclear because in the human, there are clear genetic contributions from mother and father, uh, but most of the environmental effect is thought to be through the uterus and therefore the mother. Uh, but the mother is often used as, as a surrogate for the father because they live together, they eat similar foods. So it's hard to separate non-genetic contributions from mother and father. So our data showed that fat dads had offspring who were glucose intolerant. So there's no impact of the uterus here because the fat father impregnated the dam uh, and, the, and these animals are consuming low fat food. These are all on chow. So th they had less uh, glucose toler impaired glucose tolerance, a greater glucose excursion here and impaired insulin release. So we've got a pancreatic change here. They're producing less uh, insulin. They have fewer islets producing insulin and they have a suite of uh, insulin um, beta cell gene changes in the pancreas uh, that line up with inflammatory changes, um, apoptosis, uh, and a whole range of things. And this really invokes this concept of epigenetics because we have changes in gene expression where all we've done was made the father fat. So we have to invoke some sort of epigenetic process, probably mediated through the sperm, uh, and in fact, we looked at methylation of our genes uh, and our top gene, uh, interleukin-13 RA2, which was overexpressed in the offspring of a fat dad, um, was greatly hypomethylated. So DNA methylation tends to um, remove that, um, re reduce the expression of that gene. So increased um, expression of interleukin-13 RA uh, is in line with this uh, reduced... Uh, methylation status. So we have what we think is an epigenetic ph phenomenon whereby high fat sperm from the father is having an effect on the offspring to reduce gene expression and increase risk. In terms of behavioral effects, there's some fascinating work uh, being done in this realm where epigenetic changes seem to be conferred across generations. And in this example, the fathers were given cocaine. This is a very nice paper from last year. So paternal cocaine use affected 
cocaine intake, but only in the male progeny here. These are the F1 offspring of uh, cocaine side in the dark versus control side uh, animals. So there was a an, there was a heritable increase in cortical BDNF, and again that went with the males, not the females. Um, and this reduced cocaine intake was reversed by track B inhibitor, invoking uh, BDNF in this process. Uh, in the accompanying commentary about this article. Uh, Schofield and Clive has uh, summarized it here and report on the fact that there's increased acetylation of BDNF promoter in the sperm um, of the cocaine um, fathers, and this was transmitted uh, to the male offspring who had increased acetylation of BDNF. So this is an epigenetic phenomenon where acetylation of DNA, which affects folding and therefore expression, seems to be invoked. So we have now the possibility that a father can impact on his offspring through a behavioral effect uh, that can be transmitted, and Tracy Bale and others are looking at this. Um, there's a few other examples shown here. Uh, stress in the father can affect stress responses in the progeny. Um, another interesting paper recently where olf an olfactory signal was paired with electric shock in the father and the offspring had a response to the same olfactory signal. So maternal obesity leads to changes in hypothalamic regulation of feeding and, and increases metabolic disease, and others are shown behavioral changes. Uh, exercise can ameliorate that impact. I didn't show you the data there. And we've shown that paternal obesity can impact offspring, and there's fascinating data, certainly around neuroscience, where other paternal exposures may impact offspring. The biota is a fascinating story, and we've found changes in biota in our animals, so a great reduction in lactobacillus in the animals consuming the unhealthy diet. Others have shown that probiotics can affect behavior. So here we have another example whereby uh, diet-induced changes in biota uh, may be communicating with the brain in a way that can uh, manipulate behavior. Um, so we have samples from our fat mums offspring uh, as well as the mum because we know that maternal biota are transmitted, uh, sorry, a, an offspring is um, colonized through vaginal delivery uh, and that may lead to changes in biota in the offspring. So Obesity is associated with gut biota changes and that may impact behavior. We're currently investigating this uh, by looking at behavior of animals treated with probiotics. So I've shown you data around palatable food effects on behavior and transmitter changes, early life stress being ameliorated by a high fat diet, uh, maternal and paternal obesity both contributing to offspring obesity. Uh, we haven't We've done a little bit of behavior in maternal offspring. Um, our most recent work is looking at maternal exercise. And interestingly, if we exercise mothers, we do get behavioral changes in the offspring. Um, but in those animals where the mother was lean is where we see interesting changes in behavior. And I could talk about that if you're interested. We're yet to do offspring of fat fathers behavior, but I think that's another interesting question. I just want to finish by thanking the people who've done the work, University of Melbourne, uh, previous students, uh, UNSW, the maternal people, the uh, behavioral people, my collaborators, uh, and funding sources, ARC and HMRC, the university, as well as Diabetes Australia. Thank you very much. <laughs>